es lo más principal. Desde aquí resulta bien lejos ir a Y hay veces en el pozo, hay veces se llevan de ahí abajo, creo que se llevan agua y... Hay veces llegamos, no hay ni agua vacía, se gusta que ese pozo de ahí también agua y de dónde van a traer. No se puede. Agua siempre es para todo. La agua es, la agua es vida, como dice. Vanessa, ya ha pusido aquí. Vanessa. Una muerte, no podíamos eh, cómo salvar, ya no. Porque dice que ya está contaminado y no se puede. Agua para, para lavarnos, para tener algo, aguas para que no haya un, un contagioso, un contaminado. Entonces, para defenderse de, de la enfermedad. Vanessa is eight. Her brother died because, like a billion other people around the world, her family doesn't have access to safe water. Every day, her parents have to walk a mile down the cliffs of El Alto to collect water from an unreliable well. Yet they can hear the sound of rushing water from their backyard. They live just a few hundred meters from their city's main water treatment plant and can see millions of gallons just beyond the barbed wire fence. Todos los seres vivos necesitan el del agua para vivir. Sin agua morirían las plantas, los animales y las personas. Papi, pa, mira, hasta hoy vivimos. ¿Por qué vivimos tan cerca y no tenemos agua nosotros? Podemos estar aquí en su puertita, pero no es. Cuando uno no tiene plata, no le da fácil, porque somos bolivianos y no tenemos ni esa ni ese posibilidad ni para tener agua. Entonces, todos los que tienen plata no más. Es. For Vanessa's father, Lino, it's simple economics. The mains pipe runs just a few meters from the family's home, but the connection fee charged by the French-controlled water company is as much as he earns in a year. But for Vanessa, it's about more than just money. No tengo amigos, porque no tengo agua y yo no tengo conmigo. No tengo agua y nunca me baño. No tengo amigos. If kids go to school and they're dirty, then there's a huge social stigma attached to that. They're called dirty Indians and dirty peasants. So there's the social stigma and there's the very real knock-on effects of drinking dirty water, getting diarrhea, not being able to wash your hands, having to decide with your one barrel of water what you're going to do with it. Are you going to wash clothes? You know, you might prioritise washing your body or washing your kids, but then what happens um, with the clothes? La nieve blanco es frío, ahí sí, frío. Viendo entre los cielos igual va a hervirse o se va a destruir, ya no va a... ¿Ya es montaña y mina? Todo, dice que aquí un tiempo Estados Unidos ya no tendrá agua y dice que de aquí llevarán como adobes, así. Entonces todo el hielo que está alrededor del Cerro Blanco va a ser propietario de los americanos. Y nosotros ni agua no vamos a tener peor. Con el tiempo ya no va a haber, ya no hay agua. Entonces, si ustedes ya van a ser jóvenes, adultos, así como nosotros, 
ya no va a haber, pero con el tiempo vamos a tomar aguas artificiales, creo. For Lino, the future seems bleak, but he's right. Climate change will mean less water for everyone. Lino may be facing it now, but soon it will reach all of us. About a third of the global population is already living in water stress and water scarce areas where water is chronically short. Within our lifetime, within 45 years, that is projected to increase to about half the world's population. There is a finite amount of water in the world. The population is increasing all the time. You just put that into a formula, it doesn't take very much to understand that the, um, the amount of water per head is going down. We will see the price of fresh water growing constantly. And I foresee within the next 20, 25 years that the price of a gallon of fresh water will be higher than the price is today for a gallon of gas. There should be no crisis on a planet of water, but we are in a serious water crisis. And the water crisis has been created only in the last two or three decades. There's a comet coming to Earth. It's called the freshwater crisis. And those of us who live in water-rich parts of the world have been able to just not see it. And that's really important that everybody understand. There's no way it's not going to affect everybody eventually. The rich world's response to the impending global water shortage has been to promote the idea of water as a commodity, something that can be bought and sold on the open market. The belief is that market forces will lead to greater efficiency. So should the control of water be concentrated in the hands of powerful multinationals, or should it be a basic human right? In 2000, the United Nations committed to halving the number of people in the world without water by 2015. But many believe that allowing big business to extract and sell water will only make life harder for people like Lino and Vanessa. As less and less water is available, you have yet another problem being added, and that is the problem of privatization. There are companies now saying, why don't we bottle it, mine it, divert it, sell it, commodify it. That greed of privatization, I believe, will be much worse than climate change and everything else that has left us with the water crisis. In India, the battle lines are being drawn between local farmers and the world's biggest brand over who gets to use the water beneath the desert sands of Rajasthan. How the battle unfolds could have a major impact on the future of the world's water. Bodiran has a small farm in Rajasthan, just north of the capital, Jaipur. His family and his farm have always relied on just one source of water, their well. But since Coca-Cola built a factory nearby and started pumping water from beneath the desert sands to make soft drinks, that well has run dry every year. So far, the well is 180 feet deep, but still there is no sign of water. These farmers say the water table started to drop dramatically about five years ago, just after Coca-Cola set up a factory here. The company is pumping water out of aquifers, natural underground reservoirs, to make soft drinks and bottled water. But aquifers can extend for miles underground, 
and angry farmers claim that coke is literally sucking the water from beneath their feet. Through mining the groundwater in your piece of land, you can drain 10 square miles, 20 square miles dry because the aquifer is connected even though the land above might be divided by property rights. Unfortunately, coke has situated its plant in areas which are already water stressed. And with a soft drink plant taking out half a million litre water every day, you are talking about huge stress on local water supply. Mahadev is another local farmer barely clinging to the land he inherited from his father. The family used to have a small reservoir to tide them over outside the monsoon, but since 2001, the reservoir has been empty. Mahadev fears that soon he may no longer be able to feed his family. Mahadev has had to repeatedly borrow money to drill boreholes around the farm to try to find water. After eight failed attempts, Mahadev now owes so much money that he has to break rocks at the local quarry to feed his family and repay his debts. Coca-Cola have often been accused of exploiting water, especially in India, where their plant in Kerala was forced to shut down after violent protests from farmers. For every litre of soft drink the company makes, it has to extract three litres of water. But Coke claims it's highly responsible when it comes to water use. It even has a director of global water resources. Coca-Cola depends on water, and the products we produce are, contain a significant amount of water, and so it really relates directly to our business as to how we have access to good, clean, quality water over the long term. We are a high profile user of water. However, the agriculture extracts a lot more water than Coca-Cola. Mahadev has only enough water to farm two of his 16 fields, and he has to depend entirely on the irregular public power supply to drive his pump. Every day, the pipes are moved to prepare for the few precious moments when he hopes the electricity will come on. While Mahadev only uses a tiny amount of water compared to coke, agriculture in Rajasthan does use far more water than industry. But the water farmers extract goes straight back into the local water cycle 
whereas the water Coke puts into bottles is loaded onto trucks and driven up to 200 miles away, leaving the local water cycle forever. Well, there's a major imbalance in what the water is actually being used for. If you look on the one side, you have Coca-Cola wanting to make fizzy drinks for sale on the market to bring back profits to Coca-Cola. And on the other side, you have water as an essential part of a community's entire existence. Coke says that most of the water that doesn't end up bottled and sold is carefully cleaned before being recycled to sprinkle their lawns or discharged into a local stream. The same stream that takes wastewater from all the other local factories. Coke has also built a series of recharge shafts, deep tubes filled with coarse gravel in areas that flood during the monsoon. The idea is that when it does rain, instead of the water just evaporating or running out to sea, these shafts funnel the water down to the aquifer to refill it. Coke also wanted us to meet a local village leader they knew. He had a very clear message. But some farmers at the village market didn't agree. जब कोका कोला आई थी उससे पहले हमारे 20 फीट के ऊपर पानी था हम पीएसी सिंचाई करते थे और अब वो पानी 165 या 150 फीट के लगभग चला गया कोका कोला की वजह से आस पड़ोस के 50 किलोमीटर के एरिया 10 किलोमीटर का विशेष एरिया में पानी का जो लेवल है वो 165 फीट के ऊपर चला गया है बंदी बढ़िया कोई तो सबसे बड़ी समस्या है इस कोका कोला को हटाने की It is a real concern with the local farmers. However, the data that we have in the Caldera area indicates that our water use in that area has not significantly dropped these water tables. The official government figures don't support Coke's optimism. Since the plant opened in 1999, the groundwater level has gone down dramatically. If coke is recharging so much water, then where this groundwater is going? The groundwater level should have actually gone up, not gone down. When I look at this graph, it, sh it clearly shows that the table depth has dropped over a period of time. And I don't know whether that is due to other factors uh, other than just water use. Coca-Cola later said the reason the groundwater level had dropped was because of several years of poor rainfall. Therefore, why the hell they set up the plant in these areas? I mean to say they are such water-intensive industry. They should have set up their plant where there is abundant water. What Coca-Cola is mining is precious water that has trickled down over millennia, drop by drop. And within a few years, they're not just going to leave the habitation with no water, they're going to leave the entire ecosystem with no possibility of renewal. The hardships Indian farmers endure can seem very remote to those of us living in the water-rich British Isles. But in fact, we are vitally linked to many of the water-starved countries of the world through the food we choose. We in Britain are already actually part of the problem because we expect to have all of these fresh vegetables in our supermarkets all the way through the year. It takes 650 litres of water, 10 bathtubs, to grow just a single bowl of salad. And so what we're doing is exporting a water problem to those countries. We're exporting um, conflicts about water. We're, we're exporting possible droughts. The problem is that we're not aware of the impact that our consumption habits here in Britain are having on those countries. 
Most of our salads now come from the desperately drought-stricken south of Spain, where rainfall last year was the lowest since records began. Our year-round demand for tomatoes, cucumbers and lettuce means that water is being sucked from the earth here at an unsustainable rate. The area under plastic sheeting is now so large that it can be seen from space. Vegetables from Egypt come from a nation that has threatened military action if any upstream country dams the Nile or any of its tributaries. The water taken by Israel from the River Jordan and from beneath the West Bank has turned the Israeli side of the border green. If you look at large parts of the Middle East, uprisings are being caused because of water. There are wars over water taking place already. People say that the next war will be about water. They're already taking place. Between 10 and 15 wars over the last 100 years has been related to water. That will obviously increase in the future. I mean, if you have one country full of water and the neighboring country has nothing, where do you think they will look for water? And if you don't want to share it with them, they will come and get it. <laughs> Na mimi nalipia kwa sababu nipo na report scheme mama huyu alichokifanya alitaka kunikata na pango kile anakukata eh in africa conflicts over water are already common these women are arguing because for centuries people have been able to draw the water they needed from the local river but now remote bureaucrats have decided that water for irrigation should be controlled by charging people to use it leaving precious little for those who can't afford to pay Mama Zanaibu's fury is focused on an irrigation scheme that is part of a grand plan to effectively privatize rivers across Africa by charging farmers for the right to take water from them. A plan thought up not in Tanzania, but in the World Bank in Washington, D.C. The plan is intended to make farmers value the water they use more because they're made to pay for it. But in Tanzania, those farmers who can afford to join the scheme make a one-off payment each season, no matter how much water they use. So there's no reason to use less. And so what's happened is that farmers who have a one-off fixed fee in Tanzania then feel entitled to use as much water as they can or want without necessarily thinking about um, self-regulating, in other words, reducing the amount of water they use so that they allow other users access to that same water. With 11 million lives in East Africa now threatened by drought, disputes over water can become violent. But despite these problems, there are plans to roll out schemes like this across most of Africa. And the people pushing it are economists based in the World Bank. The objective of that project was to introduce a regime of enhanced um, river basin management. And I think that was a phenomenal success. And the other side of the project was a small-scale uh, irrigation improvement program, which targeted some areas in the basin that will allow for efficient irrigation, uh, community-based irrigation systems. And that also was very, very successful. And what we're trying to do now uh, is to scale it up to the, all the other basins in the country. The World Bank's mission is to reduce global poverty 
For 25 years, the bank's headquarters in Washington has been promoting solutions in the developing world that focus on putting a price on everything. These solutions don't always make sense to the people on the ground. But battles over water aren't only happening in the developing world. In the richest nation on earth, the citizens of Detroit are also fighting to establish their right to clean water. Killers don't talk, little kids don't mind. Men don't work, don't take care of babies. You bought my album, but bootleggers don't pay me. This is a place where don't nothing surprise me to get up. Betty has lived in Detroit all her life and seen a city that was once the industrial heart of the USA fall apart. She might live in the wealthiest country in the world, but like Lino in Bolivia, she has to fetch water every day. Uh, this is Granny just coming to get some water. We make about two or three trips to get what we need to wash up for the next thing. We do this every day. My husband has uh, been diagnosed as having uh, Alzheimer's and I have to keep his clothes and, and everything for water him to drink to take his medication. It's, it's kind of hard when you have to go around from one house to another to haul water, but it happens to the best of us. Betty first got behind with her water bills when her husband fell sick and she had to pay for his treatment. Watch it, don't spill it. The water's too precious. Then two years ago, her water was cut off. She had become one of hundreds of thousands of Detroiters denied water as the city strives to make the water board more profitable. In one year period, 365 days, the Detroit Water Department disconnected service at 40,752 separate addresses. You can't put your arm around a number that big to try to realize what it means to disconnect service at 40,000 individual separate addresses. They came by water trucks, took the key and turned the water off. And uh, kept on going down the street, turning different people other waters off too. They didn't. Most of the people was at work, I guess, when they come home and they found out that the water was off. It had to been about twelve people on this block alone. They turned the water off that I know of. <laughs> It is hell. I wouldn't wish this on anybody to try to live without water. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't care if you have gas and lights and what it's a necessity to have water because it's hard to wash your clothes, take a bath, washing dishes, cooking, brushing your teeth, or anything, whatever. I mean, that's a, water is a necessity for anybody. Maureen's come to see Betty to find out how she can help the family. Betty is just one of thousands of water cutoffs that are being championed by Michigan Welfare Rights. We take from 15 to 18 calls an hour for water. Just regular folks, uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims, some that don't believe in nothing. Uh, uh, this this shut off of water is an equal opportunity offender. Now. The bills started to back up then when the income started to be challenged. My husband got sick and I had to take off from work. And I, I had to pay a lot of medical bills and that's how I got behind in my water bill. Okay. Now, how much is the water bill? I owe 3000 for water. 
Ooh-wee. You been uh, providing yeah. um, uh, mm-hmm. swimming pools up and down the block? <laughs> mm-hmm. It's not possible to have a $3,000 water bill. Betty may have been disconnected for two years, but she's still getting water and sewerage bills, and they're still going up. All right, this says they're also charging you $4,000 worth of sewage. And how long has the water been well, off? I heard that the water is off. That's why I'm confused. It's not, you're not confused. You know madness when you see it. You're not confused. <laughs> I think you owe the water department 800 and something dollars. That's what I think, and that's what I'm going to fight for. Now, they may say no. They may say $900. I'm going to say seven. I'm going to go the other way. Okay. Now, you got to promise you're not going to put no more water in nobody else's swimming pools up oh, and down your that. block. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I don't know where to hug you or kiss you. It's too much. There are too many cases. And now we have another example of a human being with a disabled husband. Uh, who for two years has been living without water. You know, you can't call yourself a part of the uh, greatest nation in the world. When you have this kind of circumstances, just like all the rest of them, it's unconscionable. But things don't look like they're going to improve for the poor of Detroit. The people that shut accounts have a workload of 32 accounts a day. And now there's a proposal to try and get them to do as many as 60 accounts a day, which would amount to an account every three minutes. Currently, it's winter in Detroit and the ground is really hard, but the ground is going to thaw and the water department will certainly be aggressively shutting water off in the, in the residential areas of Detroit. Emily and her water workers union blame the aggressive cutoff policy on the city's mayor and his water department director, Victor Mercado, a man who was formerly vice president of the private water company, Thames Water North America. The unions fear the cutoffs and a deliberate policy of running down the system is preparing the water department to join the many across America that have already been controversially privatized. The city denies this, but for politicians, privatization can be very attractive. With water in private hands, they can escape blame for a water board's failings. The water service, sorry, is not sexy. You spend a ton of money and you bury it in pipes. It's not visible. The mayor can't go around saying, this is me, I've done this. So the running down strategy is one we've seen in a number of countries, where you can starve the utility of capital. So then the the citizens who are unhappy with the public service will then accept any alternative, including privatization, which, as we know in our experience, has significant problems in it. To understand those problems, we returned to Bolivia. The people of El Alto and La Paz have been living with a privatized water provider for several years now. Aguas del Ilimani is majority owned and controlled by one of the world's biggest water multinationals, the French company Suez. But some residents of El Alto, like Lino and Flora, deeply distrust the company. Flora is outraged because the main water pipe runs under the street right in front of their house. But Aguas de Limani wants $200 to connect them a sum way beyond the means of Flora's family and many others in El Alto. If the family wanted to go further and also have the house connected to the sewers so the children no longer had to use the yard as a toilet, they would have to find a total of $450. Let's put that in perspective. The minimum wage in Bolivia is $60 a month. So what you're talking about is Suez has said to people, hey, if you want sewage and water for your house, you have to put out the equivalent of nine months of salary. But Suez say they are not responsible for deciding the cost of connection. 
At the beginning of the contract, the government asked for a few things, developing networks, bringing more water to more people, etc., etc. So we said we have to make some investments and we have to get some income. And the government said, to get this kind of income, you will increase the price of the connection fee. And we don't have any choice. Suez say the high connection fees should also be judged against relatively low water rates. But that's little comfort for families who could never afford to get connected in the first place. Diarrhea is the single biggest killer of children under five in the poor countries of the world. 3,900 children die every single day because of lack of access to clean water and adequate sanitation. Now, if you think about it, that's about 20 jumbo jets full of children crashing every single day. ¿De dónde tiene el agua usted? Del pozo. Saca de pozo. Sí. Entonces, esa agua, señora, no es potable. Agárrele nomás. No es potable esa agua. Cuando el agua está contaminada, sí. tiene microbios, bacterias, virus, y las bacterias y los virus también producen la diarrea. Estas enfermedades, por ejemplo, la, los casos que yo he estado recibiendo son intoxicaciones. Los niños vienen con un cuadro característico de náuseas, vómitos, mareos. El 10% de la población infantil en nuestro medio muere a causa de los problemas de agua. El 90% se debe a enfermedades producidas por agua. Eh, también sucede que a estos niños que no los hacen bien, tienen esta otra enfermedad llamada sarcoptosis. Como médica, aconsejarle a la mamá, ¿no? señora, por favor, cámbiemele su ropita diariamente, una ropa limpia. Me da incluso vergüenza decirle eso, porque no tienen agua para lavar la ropa. No tienen agua para bañarles diariamente a las guaguitas. Entonces, da impotencia, da dolor decirle a la mamá, inclusive, haga esto, señora. Yo, yo quisiera, yo tuviera plata, yo hubiera podido ir a hablar a Francia, a ese caballero. Nosotros sufrimos en Bolivia porque es, de aquí no hay un orden para los pobres. Y los pobres no van a pagar, vamos a pagar, pero, pero que no haya ese crédito muy alto. Eso es donde nos afecta a los pobres. Suez say Alemani has done an excellent job in El Alto and that they have connected people at almost three times the rate of the public water utility before them. When we arrived, about 60% of the population only in El Alto was having water service. Now we are in the served area with almost 100% of the population with water. But there's an important difference between having water service and actually having water. Independent research has revealed that around 200,000 people, a quarter of the population, are without mains water. It's consistent. It's consistent. Why? Because when we say that 100% of the people have access to the water, you have to take into account one very sad thing. There is no obligation for any customer any people having his house on the, along the pipe to get connected to the pipe. We cannot say, well, the pipe is there, you must, be, you must get connected. It's impossible. So we are, the area is covered, but some people are not connected. I've chosen not to be connected. Suez likes to proclaim that in the area that they do serve, that 98% of the people have water. Well, 98% of the people don't have water. 98% of the people have a water tube running down their street, but that doesn't mean that they're actually connected to the water system. At Lino's house, a local councillor has come to see if he can help. Yeah. 
Sí, pues es mucha plata, ¿no? Sí. O sea, vos no, ¿a qué te dedicas, digamos? Bueno, pues, mira, yo me dejo un huesito, está tapado, ¿eh? Un huesito, de saclo, no sé cómo es de saclo, este es plástico. Ah. Ese es mi trabajo, ir en contenedor, en contenedor, ni al cabo. Ah, sí. Cuando no hay agua, hasta mi familia está mal de salud, ya. Pues, no, no quiere que yo, no sufrí mucho, o mis hijas, o mis hijos. A disculpar. <risa> ah. As water privatization spreads around the world, more and more people like Lino feel they're the victims of multinational corporations. Corporations that have a duty to put the interests of their shareholders before the needs of the populations they serve. So where did this obsession with privatization begin? To answer that, we need look no further than the British House of Commons. Privatisation is a very much better deal for the consumer. That is the message. In 1987, after selling off the gas board, the phones, British Steel and the airports, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher decided that public water should be next. Mr Speaker, as has been proved on many occasions, the privatised water supply is very much more efficient than a public organisation. Privatisation is a very much better deal for the consumer. That is the message. Margaret Thatcher and her friends in the World Bank, and then of course Ronald Reagan and everyone who subscribed to this theory of everything being for sale, decided that this was a great way to make money. And they saw that the world was running out of fresh water, and so they set out to commodify the world's water system in a very short time. The World Bank has since promoted water privatization in countries across Africa, Asia, South America, and the former Soviet Union all in the name of increasing the efficiency of public water services. As Margaret Thatcher hoped, the British companies she helped create have become world leaders in privatization. One of them recently took control of the water supply in the capital of Tanzania, Dar es Salaam. The water table here is very high, so the cheapest way to get water is simply to dig a hole and line it with tires. But with no proper sewerage system, the excrement of nearly two million people goes straight into the ground. So unless it's boiled, this water is potentially lethal. Safer water comes through the taps, but only the houses of the relatively rich are connected to the mains, so most people buy it by the bucket from water cellars. Their taps are strictly controlled and locked when the trader shuts up shop. These women have to travel so far for water because otherwise they have to pay the water boys who wheel 50 litre containers around the city. They might bring the water to your door, but the more people involved in the chain of delivery, the more expensive it becomes. Mm. 
Napakia kwa toi langu wa dumu kumi, naenda tena mjiani, na uza dumu moja mbili. Kwa siku biyasha kia wanzuli, minaenda mbaka tipu kumi na mbili. Wanza saa kumi na mbili asumu. Na kutika maji tipu kumi na mbili. Kata majeme kutokea, wakati fulani kubo gana na mipini kufunchika. Kili chobaki, utie kumi kukonga nishi trafu kwa mesha kipa. Na maana ya wena fiki wali sema. Maka uka uwishi mila wewe kuwa chiangazi. Na kili chakusha kata paka sasa unatesa. Tenana tena. Mama Maji. Una uzaji? Na uzadumu miambiri. Maji, punguza buwana. Maji Lete, shida. Miamia mina chukua yote? Miamia mama sozi. Eh? Maji shida sana. Maji shida? Eh, maji shida. Afu watoka mbaani sana. Basi punguza buwana. Basi we miamsini. Miamsini ya hiripu. Asi weo na nunua kwa shingishiri. Zini kata hea, lakini ya hiripu. Eh? Punga kwa natapu. Miambili basi tabidi ni chukua yote ndumu tatu. Ndumu tatu? Eh. Sao. Manake gali mno. Sao. With water supplies this chaotic, the World Bank and the government decided to partially privatize water in Dar es Salaam. Because of years of uh, socialist orientation and inefficiency in general, the government felt that bringing in private sector would be useful. So it, the experiment was to start with Dar es Salaam and if it works, maybe extend it to other cities in the country. The government and the World Bank guessed privatization might prove unpopular, but they had a wealthy ally. Although water privatization was opposed by Labour during Mrs Thatcher's time, the Blair government has spent hundreds of millions of pounds through the foreign aid budget, helping privatization in many forms in the developing world. In Tanzania, the UK government funded this pop song selling the idea of privatization to the people. The British government's investment paid off. The taxpayer helped a British company buy water from a joint venture, City Water, to manage Dar es Salaam's utility. Bywater has been involved in many privatizations and knows the potential profit and the potential risks. In 1999, the chairman, Adrian White, advised other companies to try to tilt the playing field in their favour before getting involved. Don't take the plunge, he said, unless... There's a government guarantee of payment, protection against inflation, devaluation and foreign exchange fluctuation, a guaranteed return on investment, an automatic tariff increase formula, no real competition and no upfront payments. Seven years on, Bywater says it's reviewed this position. It now runs businesses around the world and has described itself as the perfect water company. So customers like Christina hoped things would soon improve. She works in one of Dar's top hotels, where guests never run short of water. But when she went home, she found her taps were working less and less often. Before city water, we were getting water three full days per week. Lakini city water walipokuja, maji yakawa yamepungua sana. Na badala yake yanatoka usiku. Na walipunguza hata ile siku tatu, ikawa ni marabili. Aosa ingine tusipate kabisa hata hiyo usiku huu. I'm angry, but what can I do? Christina and her husband have four children, all still at school, and now a baby grandchild. So it was a shock that as the taps went dry, the bills went up. Na bili ambaye tulikuwa tunalipa ilikuwa ni shilingi elfu kumna tano. Lakini site wata walipo kuja, walipandisha bei ya, ya bili, ikawa elfu ishirina tano. Na hata hivi, walipunguza maji. Elfu ishirina tano ni robo ya mshahara wangu. Lakini nikilipia elfu ishirina tano maji, nitakuwa bado nime, nimekuwa na kasoro ya hela, yani nitakuwa sina balance ya ina yoyote. Nilichagua afadhali ni chote maji kwa jirani lakini niwalipie watoto wangu kwa sababu 1025 kama nitaweka 1025 kwa miezi sita tayari nimeshalipa ada ya mtoto wangu mmoja When City Water came round to cut off Christina they not only disconnected her water at the stopcock they also confiscated her taps and filled her pipes with concrete 
to make sure she didn't illegally reconnect her supply. But the billing department was not quite so efficient. Months after being cut off, like Betty in Detroit, she is still being sent bills for water she could never have used. Even if I don't have water, they charge me. That's why every month they come here. They charge me. Bywater accepts there were price increases, but says these were set out in their contract with the government and that while some people may have received less water, others saw marked improvements in supply. I'm sure there's a varied picture. Um, I'm sure you can find people also who said we've had water for the first time for 20 years. I've been to Dar es Salaam and it's not comfortable when you see people who don't have access to water, who have to buy it off the street vendors and pay 10 times more than we would be charging them, that type of thing. What I can say though is that people did generally, all I can go on is the basic numbers and quantities and qualities and the independent checks that were undertaken to say that somebody somewhere was getting more water. <laughs> One group who should have an independent view on water supplies are the water sellers. So how did City Water affect their business? All over the world, people in their governments have had similar experiences after water privatization. After 18 months, the Prime Minister of Tanzania also became disillusioned. They want to maximize their profits. Simple. And we needed the situation of water to improve in Dar es Salaam badly. People have been going without water for quite a while. So we thought they are, the, the contract would have begun well and they would have done a good job. They let us down badly. But Bywater disagrees. I prefer to refer to independent consultants who've been engaged by DFID on behalf of the British government, who've actually issued a report recently which has said that things improved under our stewardship, that the amount of water supplied into the system increased, that the quality of the water increased. But when we asked DFID for a copy, they said they have no knowledge of any such report. The Tanzanian government was able to supply us with a copy of the independent audit they commissioned from the consultancy Price Waterhouse. This report, according to the Prime Minister, supports his view that the company has failed to deliver. I think it's an, it's an interesting audit, that one. Um, I think there are quite a lot of examples where government co commissions audits and defines the terms of reference that delivers the answer that, surprisingly, they, they quite expected um, or they wanted, let's put it that way. Eventually, negotiations broke down. The government withdrew from the contract and senior British staff of City Water were told to leave the country. We said, we cannot continue. Sorry. Let's meet in arbitration. What did they say to you? Oh, they said we meet in court, of course. They are very anxiously waiting for us in court. We, we shall represent ourselves there, and we are sure we shall win the case. The Tanzanian government just said, that's it, jump on the plane and don't ever darken our shores again. So the private sector has been discredited, unfairly discredited, by our treatment in Dar es Salaam. And the fact that this failed through a political decision is something that I don't want to ruin our professional image and our professional reputation. Because we're good. We're good at what we do. But the Prime Minister has very clear advice for any other developing world nations being pressurised by the World Bank to privatise their water. Think again before you privatise. Privatising water is, to me, dangerous. 
But the World Bank still sees things differently. The government's characterization of the situation is that it's not a policy failure, it's a contractual failure. So they are still committed to some form of private sector participation. When the World Bank says that this has been a contractual failure and not a policy failure, what they're trying to say is that the idea was a good idea, it just hasn't been implemented properly. And that's what they've said time and time again. Privatisation, according to the World Bank, is still a good idea. It's just that people aren't doing it correctly. The World Bank believes in water privatisation um, in the way other people believe in Jesus, Muhammad or Buddha. Um, the World Bank believes in water privatisation as a matter of theology. The bank says it's evolving policy and things are changing, but those on the ground keep seeing the same solutions being pushed. If you look at projects that the bank are actually um, pursuing in different countries, the reality is rather different. And currently, practice on the ground is still very much about pursuing this agenda of privatization, an agenda that has been shown already to fail around the world. Privatization isn't working for people because ultimately when we make profit taking the most important thing as opposed to delivery of water the most important thing, it's not a big surprise at the end of the day the people who don't have money don't have water. Poor families in the slums of Manila, in the Philippines, in Colombia and in other countries around the world have had to send their children out to work in order to boost the family income, again in order to meet these higher water costs. Water is naturally a monopoly and your clientele must access it or die. So these make water a very particular service um, that does not behave according to market dynamics. Competition does not exist. Uh, the profit uh, motive does lead to significant distortions. Water has become a kind of blue gold of the 21st century, much in the way that oil was seen as the black gold of the last century. And you remember that a lot, set of large corporations and very powerful governments made energy into a cartel, divided it up and drove up the prices and didn't give access to those who couldn't afford it. That very same model is the model that's now being used for freshwater services. Uh, it's backed by the World Bank. It's backed by the powerful governments of the North. Uh, and it is now being imposed in a quite draconian fashion on the Global South. Not everybody thinks that making water a commodity is a bad idea. In Oslo, this bag has been filled with over a tonne of water and is about to be dropped 20 metres to test its strength. Bags like this, but as large as a football field, are already being used to trade huge quantities of water. One of the ways of solving the growing crisis of water shortages is to treat water, fresh water, as a commodity. Because if it is treated as a commodity, first of all, you will make a market for it. There will be profit in dealing with it. And people will be able to put a value on the commodity. A trade in water already exists in England, with water companies in wetter areas selling to those with a drought. This massive pipeline encircles London and lets engineers move water to where it's needed at the touch of a button. But moving water in bulk by ocean-going water bag or tanker will become more common in the near future. There have been projects between Spain and Northern Africa. There are projects in the South China Sea. And there is a big project about to come alive to transport water from the River Rhone in France to Israel. The Iranian project we are about to start up, we are talking about quantities of between 100 and 200 million cubic meters per year. To visualize that, you can think about an Olympic swimming pool. We will transport at least 1,000 swimming pools per day, 365 days a year. Others feel that making water a commodity will just make life worse for the poor. The most powerful argument against commodification is, is this notion of bulk transfer of water. 
because if it is commercially owned by large corporations, they are going to sell that water to the places and people and industries that can afford it, not to El Alto Bolivia, not to the places that need it. Precious water cannot be treated as a commodity because that already means that those who cannot reach the marketplace, those who don't have the purchasing power, those who are on the margins, and the rest of life, the plants, the trees, the microbes, will have no right to water. And I do not think it is given to any organization on this planet to basically rewrite the laws of life. Abajo la están nacionales. Abajo. Fuera aguas del Ilimani. Fuera. In Bolivia, the pressure on Suez is growing. So far, the protests have been peaceful, but even Lino is talking about taking drastic action. O atacar aguas del Ilimani o destruirlo de una vez, porque aquí no podemos aguantar los pobres o aquellos. What everyone fears is a repeat of the Bolivian water war of 2000, when the American company Bechtel took over the water supply in the city of Cochabamba and increased water charges dramatically. People reacted immediately. In January of 2000, the streets behind me were filled with people protesting the water increases. And this was going to be a peaceful protest. To everybody's surprise, the government sent into Cochabamba 1,200 armed police. Policías especializados en reprimir a la gente con palos, con chicotes, con gases, además muy bien equipados con motocicletas y pesos. All the people went into the streets and it was even worse and more violent because they were really angry. The government declared a state of martial law. You couldn't be on the street at night. They were going around to people's homes in the middle of the night and arresting them. That's what was going on here, all in the name of keeping this foreign corporation happy and keeping their contract uh, intact. But the arrest of Oscar Oliveira and the other leaders of the protest just inflamed the public and thousands more joined the demonstrators. Then the police started to use live ammunition. Hubieron más de 30 heridos de bala, eh, unos ocho jóvenes que quedaron lesionados de por vida, perdieron sus ojos, se fracturaron sus brazos eh, por las balas eh, eh, y hubieron centenares de heridos por gases y balines. A 17-year-old boy, Victor Ugodaza, was shot and killed. It became very clear that there was no way that Bechtel could stay in this city, and finally the leaders of Bechtel fled. Soon afterwards, the president was forced to resign, and now history is repeating itself. After more mass protests over privatization, another government has collapsed and the country has elected South America's first ever indigenous premier. He has appointed the leader of the protests in El Alto as the new water minister, so things don't look good for Suez. For the moment, the company is still in charge and Lino is still unable to pay the connection fee. But he has heard that the local authorities are now encouraging people to connect illegally. Suman 208.000 habitantes que están condenados a no tener agua, hermano. Hasta la muerte. Padre. Ya, están condenados. Si no hay agua, pues están, estamos, digamos, condenados a morir, ¿no ve? Hay una resolución que los presidentes de la ciudad del Alto, pues todos los presidentes, han emitido donde indica la desobediencia civil. Eh, trataremos de colaborarte eh, con la desobediencia civil, de eh, conectar, digamos, eh, de manera directa cosa que eh, cuando digamos aguas de imán se vaya pues yeah. ustedes puedan regularizar del yeah. consumo vamos a pagar sí. ¿ya? Yeah. pero lo que no vamos a pagar es con esta desobediencia civil el costo alto que se paga aguas de imán no in Detroit too water protests are mounting Maureen and Emily are marching on the house of Mayor Kilpatrick, demonstrating against the aggressive program of cut-offs. Andy 
anybody could be visited with this nightmare about not being able to have water. Right. We need to stand together against the shut off of water of poor right. people. Water right. is a human rights issue. Illegal connections are also on the increase. People need their utilities. You can't live without water. I'm like the Robin Hood. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Troy is one of a growing band of local entrepreneurs who provide an unofficial reconnection service. With almost as many families in Detroit without water as there are in El Alto, his business is booming. You see how deep it goes down in there? You know what I'm saying? Twist it, it's on. And I'm out. Just that quick. I think the water department is not meeting a need of yours, so you're forced into doing illegal stuff in order to survive. And it shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that. Two of Betty's children and three grandchildren live with her and her husband. As long as the house is without water, Maureen knows there is a risk that the grandchildren may be taken into care because you have no water. If you're a welfare recipient with minor children, it can mean that protective services can be called to your home and your minor children can be taken out of your household and placed into foster care because you don't have water. I can't stay here without water. I got children in the house. So I went to the hardware store and I got a key and I learned how to turn it off and on myself. I do it like at night. I don't do it in the daytime because I don't want to be seen. I don't like living like I'm living when you got the duck and dodge every time you turn around. And you know a bill has to be paid, you know? It's not no easy way to live. I don't know it is illegal, but what could I do about it? If you had told me this five years ago, I wouldn't believe it. How they gonna do their homework when their homes don't work? They can't read books cause the lights don't work. They can't take a bath cause the water don't work. The stove in the kitchen plus the heat don't work. Every day it's a struggle to be alive. Mentally, physically, only the strong survive. And yeah, this is life, man. In Bolivia, Lino is also ready to break the law to bring his family water. In El Alto, Lino's struggle to get water is finally drawing to a close. The local authorities have looked into his case and told him he can connect illegally to the water main outside his house. Lino and Flora just have to buy the tools and pipe they need and they can at last connect the family. Lino is still afraid that he will be caught by Aguas de Lilimani, but the support of the local authorities has given him courage. Aguas de Lilimani no es, esta si ya nos hace prisionero, pero ya tiene que ser todo en figobe más o menos unos unas carpetas de esta altura unos 6, 8. Entonces, esas personas tendrán que ir toditos, 200.000 personas. Entonces, nos unimos y que que el que hago es de limán y que hables de las celdas. Si hay, ¿no? Entonces, creo que no, no va a ser esto. To minimize the chances of being discovered by the company, Lino is hoping to get the whole job done in the course of a single night. He's persuaded some of his friends to help him dig, but with temperatures dropping well below freezing, they need plenty of home-brewed liquor, coca leaves and cigarettes to keep out the bitter chill.
4,000 miles north in Detroit, Betty is also having to dig in secret. The latest problem I have now, since I had my water turned back on illegally, I found out that I had a sewer problem in my basement, and that's been backing up. We dig it out ourselves because we don't have the money to have the guy to do it for us because he's asking for $400, and that's $400 that we don't have. Pull it up. They're trying to find the main drain pipe, which we don't know too much about, but they do say it's black. Life is a bitch when you're trying to make, make ends meet. Because of the blockage, the basement is filling with raw sewage. Oh, God. I'll never tell nobody I haven't tasted shit before. Shit. <laughs> Damn. Detroit NFI. And there's further bad news from Maureen, who's been trying to negotiate with the water board for the last six months. So are you someplace where I can call you back? It's been a long battle, and we're not finished yet. After multiple telephone calls to the water department, letters of inquiry, requests for hearings, we found that the water bill is $8,000. Sometime I do, I get depressed, and they know. Mm -hmm. That was one time that I, that I told my kids I was gonna take my own life. When it got to a heart, you know, for him, when he was taking everything. And I didn't know which way to turn at that time. After 12 hours of digging, Lino has found the main water line. He's still fearful of discovery by Lamani but the family may soon have water. Six years after the nations of the world committed to halving the number of people without water, there is no chance that target will be met. Unless governments are prepared to commit the resources to ensure water is a human right rather than just a tradable commodity, there will be more and more families like Lino's in the poor south and like Betty's in the rich north. Water is an emotive issue. It's about rights, it's about my health. It's very, very political. Time for making decisions on water is now. In some parts of America, people are using 800 liters per person per day, which is totally unsustainable. We have to share this common commodity, which means that somebody will have to have less in order to give those who have nothing a little more. And this will, of course, cause a lot of political turmoil, especially in the countries where they have been used to swim in drinking water. Literally. Every citizen in the planet, the rich world, the poor world, needs to now turn into a water conserver. Every day, everything they do has to be with the consciousness that they have to be either part of the solution of the water crisis or they will be part of the problem. <laughs> Adios,